good night, good morning. Um, so this is the only chance I'm getting to do some of these um, CSEC physics videos. All right, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Terry David. Um, I have a popular maths channel and chemistry channel. I'm also the author of the official study guides for Cape Physics Unit 1 and 2, right? Um, so in this, in this video here, I'm going to be looking at some concepts in electricity, right? So the first thing, first thing I want you all to understand you all need to understand what an electric current is, right? So, first thing, an electric current. So an electric current is simply a flow of charge, right? An electric current is a flow of charge, right? So you can ask you to define what an electric current is. It's a flow of charge. Now, what does that mean? So, electric current I is given by Q over T, where Q is my charge, and the SI unit for charge is coulombs, right? And time in this formula has to be in seconds, right? Time in seconds. This is T in seconds. And my the SI unit for current, right? So this is I, which is current. And current is measured in amperes, right? So electric current is simply a flow of charge, right? Now the thing is, in a piece of wire, right? So let's say you have a piece of wire here. And we have an electric current, I, that is flowing through the wire, right? Now, based on the structure of a piece of copper wire, we have free electrons that are able to move. So in the wire, we have charge carriers, which are electrons. So my charge carriers in a piece of wire are electrons, right? So now in the case of, let's say an electrolyte, right? So let's say we have a solution containing, let's say, we take some salt, which is sodium chloride, and we mix it in water. We're gonna get sodium chloride aqueous, and within that sodium chloride aqueous, we're gonna have sodium ions, which is Na plus Aq, but we also have Cl minus Aq, right? So we have ions present in an electrolyte. So this here is what we call an electrolyte. Right now, if I were to pass two pieces of wire through that solution and use a battery, right? What is going to happen is an electric current is going to flow through that electrolyte. And the reason why an electric current is flowing there is because the sodium ions as well as the chloride ions are moving inside the electrolyte. So there's a difference when we are looking at the current flowing through a piece of wire. It is free electrons that is flowing through the wire. Whereas in an electrolyte, we have sodium. In this case, we have ions present, sodium ions and chloride ions, all right? And please make sure you know this formula. I is equal to Q over T, or sometimes we see it written as Q is equal to I multiplied by T, right? So for example, let's say we have a question like this. Um, charge, 24 coulombs flowed for let's say two minutes right and I would have asked you to calculate the current that flowed now the current that flowed is equal I is equal to Q just charge over time right in this case I'm telling you it's 24 coulombs so it's going to be 24 divided by time but here's the thing, the time here is measured in minutes. In the formula, time needs to be in seconds. So I need to convert that 
um, two minutes into seconds and in order to do that it's going to be 2 multiply by 60 because you have 60 seconds in one minute right so this will give me let's work that out so that's 24 divided by 120 and that'll give us 0 0.2 amps 0 0.2 amps right so always remember in this formula we are using time in seconds right let's say we have something like this um, a current of 20 milliamps flows for 1.5 minutes right so we have a current of 20 milliamps flowing for 1.5 minutes Calculate A, the charge that flowed and B, the number of electrons that flowed. Right? So this is a typical exam question, exam question for about six marks. Um, let's do the first part. So the first part, they want the charge that flowed. Right? So the same formula we were using just now, I is equal to Q over T. It can be written as Q is equal to I multiplied by T. In this case, we know the current is 20 milliamps. Now, you need to be careful with your units here because they've given us current in milliamps but in the formula i needs to be in amps so 20 milliamps is 20 by 10 to the minus 3 multiply by my time look at the time the time is given in minutes i need to convert that into seconds so that is 1.5 minutes multiplied by 60 all right so my charge that flowed in this case will be 20 milliamps that's 20 by 10 to the minus 3 multiplied by 1.5 multiplied by 60 right and that will give us a charge of 1.8 coulombs right so that's my charge that flowed in 1.5 minutes now the part b now they want to know the number of electrons that flowed now in order to work this question you need to know the charge on one electron the charge on one electron is 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 coulombs so in the exam question they will give you that you need to know that so I know the charge on one electron I also know the charge that flowed the charge that flowed is 1.8 coulombs right so the number of electrons is equal to my total charge over the charge on one electron right so my total charge is 1.8 coulombs so it's 1.8 divided by 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 because that is the charge on one electron and this will give me so 1.8 divided by 1.6 by 10 to the 19 minus and i'm gonna get an answer of 1.125 by 10 to the 19 and obviously this has no units because we are talking about number of electrons all right so this is a typical exam question you can get concerning um current and charge right so you need to make sure you knew the formula q equal i t now kind of just i'm going for my head here right i'm using the syllabus all right um let me just tell you something here okay so you all need to know what is the difference between a conventional current and actual flow of electrons. So look at this circuit diagram here. I have a circuit diagram, I have a resistor, let's just bring a light bulb here. Alright, now this is my positive terminal, this is my negative terminal. Now, typically, 
what we do, we say current flows from positive to negative, right? So what is happening is that we are saying that current is going this way. That current is what we call our conventional current. Convention. So this is what we call our conventional current, right? But there's something that you all need to know. If the current is flowing in that direction, the actual electrons are flowing in the opposite direction. So electrons actually flow in the opposite direction, right? Another thing you need to know, if you have a positive charge moving in this direction, the current I is also moving in that direction. So my current, so if a positive charge is moving in that direction, my current I is also in that same direction. But if you have a negative charge, right, and the negative charge is moving in this direction, then my current will be moving in the opposite direction. Right now, there's some historical sign significance as to why it's like this. Right, initially they are taught that current is flowing from positive to negative, and then they realize, oh wait, electrons are what are actually moving, and they're moving in the opposite direction to what they thought the current was moving in. All right, so make sure you understand the difference between conventional current and the flow of electrons. Right, they are in opposite directions. Now, let's see what else the syllabus wants you to know. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So just for your knowledge as well. So we already said that current is measured in amperes, right? That's the SI unit for current. Um, we know the formula. Um, one second. Let me see what I want. Right. So Q is equal to I multiplied by T right and we know the unit for charge is coulomb so one coulomb can be written as current is measured in amps as one amp multiplied by one second so an equivalent unit for the coulomb is one ampere second right you may see this in a multiple choice exam so let's see something again here all right, so the next thing you all need to know, you all need to be able to differentiate between direct current and alternating current, right? So, in physics or in electricity, we have a current, and a current could be either direct current, right? Or sometimes you see DC. So direct current is DC, now, what is direct current? In the exam, you might be able, they might be asked to differentiate between direct current and alternating current. So with direct current, the current flows in one direction only. So direct current, the current flows in one direction only. That's right now about there. Flows in one direction only. Right, so that is what DC is. Now, current can also be classified as alternating current. So you have something called alternating current. Right, now what an alternating current is, the current changes direction. So the current changes direction regularly with time right that's what alternating current is now what else do you need to know now in the exam they can give you graphs and ask you which one is a direct current which one is an alternating current so let me give you a few graphs so the first graph, oh wait, hold on. Um, let me give you an example of direct current. So 
A direct current is what typically comes out of a, a dry cell, right? I mean, we call it a battery, but that is really one cell, right? More than one cell, we call it a battery. So direct current comes from a cell. In the case of alternating current, alternating current is what you get coming from your main supply. So the power coming to your house is alternating current, right? But there are many devices inside your home that requires the use of direct current. For example, when you have to charge your cell phone, right? The current that you are using to charge your cell phone is a direct current. It is not easy current that we're using. When we plug it into the outlet, it's alternating current. But there's a device there that converts the alternating current into a direct current, all right? Um, so back to the graphs. So let me show you something. So this here, let's say I have a graph of current versus time. If I draw a graph like this, this graph here shows what we call a direct current. So this is direct current, right? Now, in the case of this here, and I draw a graph like this, This graph represents what we call an alternating current, right? How do we know that? Notice part of the graph is above my time axis and then part of the graph is below my time axis. That means that my current is changing direction regularly with time. So that's an alternating current, right? If I have something like this, by the way, you can see this in the multiple choice exam, right? So this is current versus time. And if the graph look like this, right? That current is also direct current. This is also DC, right? That is not AC, right? And the reason why it's not AC, you realize it's not going below my time axis, all right? If I have a graph that looks like this, I have time, current, and the graph does this. Um, right? This again is a DC. This is not AC. Right? This is still DC. And the reason why we are not going below the time axis. All right? So only one of them here is what we call AC. Right? And that is this graph here. This graph is the only one that is AC. Okay, now with respect to AC currents, there's something you need to know. So in the case of alternating currents, there are two formulas that you need to know. Well, actually there's one. Um, so period, right? Let me show you something first of all. Let's draw a circuit here. So this is an alternating current, right? And you all need to be able to determine from a graph like this what the period of the current is. So period, all right, the symbol we use is a big T, right? And it's the time taken for one oscillation. Now, with respect to one oscillation, one oscillation could be from this point here to this point, that is one oscillation, right? Another point or another oscillation could be from this point here to this point here. So this here, so, so from here to here is one period. Right? Um, let me get a green marker here. From here to here is also one period, right? Another period could be from this point to this point here, and this is also T, right? So there are different ways you can measure the period of oscillation from a graph like this, right? So the period is big T. Now, the frequency now, 
So frequency. So by the way, um, period is measured in seconds and frequency is measured in hertz, right? And the formula relating those two is frequency is equal to one over t, right? That's a formula you need to know. Now, you need to be careful with some of these questions. So let me show you something. So let's say I have a graph like this. Right, so I have I, not to concern what I is. So this is time in seconds, right? And we're going like this. Let's say zero, um, 20, 40, 60, 80, right? So I'm just putting in some numbers here. So this is an alternating current, and I'm asking you find um, A, the period, and B, the frequency, right? Those are two things we wanna find, period and the frequency. So to find the period, we need to measure this from directly from the graph. So because the graph is labeled like this, one period is from here to here. Right, so my period, so E, my period T is equal to 20 and it's whatever unit you see here. Now you gotta be careful with the unit because I'll give you another example where they try to trick you sometimes, right? So my period T is 20 seconds. For part B now, you wanna find frequency. So frequency is one over T, right? Which is one over 20, right? Which is, um, 0 0.05 so 1 over 20 gives me 0 0.05 hertz right so that's my frequency for this particular alternating current now let's try another one now now this one now you're gonna have to pay attention so time in milliseconds So this is zero, this is current I, um, let's say, let's go 10, 20, 40, um, sorry, 10, 20, 30, 10, 20, 30, 40, right? And again, we wanna find A, period, and B, the frequency, all right? So again, to measure the um, period, we need to get that directly from the graph. So we're looking from here to here, but you need to be careful. Look at the unit for the time axis. It's milliseconds, right? So some students, they, they don't look at the time axis and they come and they, they read off the period wrong. So some students might say, oh, well, the period is 20 seconds. That is wrong. So for part A, my period T is equal to 20 milliseconds, right? It's not 20 seconds, look at the time axis. And for part B now, my frequency is one over T, which is one over 20 milliseconds, but milli is 10 to the minus three. So it's one over 20 by 10 to the minus three. Now, when you all are doing physics calculations, please, please, please make sure you understand how to use your calculator. You need to know what your prefixes stand for. So this is gonna give me 50 hertz, right? So that's the, that's how we find um, period and frequency um, from an alternating current graph, all right? So can I just teach in from my head here, basically, I just looking at the syllabus. Um, what else you need to know? All right, so we spoke about current. Current is simply the flow of charge. Now, we have something else called, what well, is a formula 
which is V is equal to E over Q. Now, V, right, is what we call voltage, right? E is energy in joules. So this is energy in joules. This is charge in coulombs, right? And this here is voltage in volts. Now, here's the thing. I need you all to understand the difference between something called potential difference right so we have something called potential difference and we have something called electromotive force force or we call it in short most of the time we speak of emf now lots of people they confuse the two terms or they use the two terms interchangeably but they are two different things right so for example in a circuit if I have something like this, let's put a resistor and let's put a, a bulb, right? So here's what here's the difference. Now both the, both of them are defined using the same formula, yeah? right? So it's the so potential difference or that's not. In shorthand form, we call it PD, right? Now, PD and electro electromotive force are two different things. So we can speak of potential difference across a resistor. We can speak about potential difference across a bulb. But when it comes to a cell or a battery, right? We speak about EMF. We don't say potential difference across a battery, right? So EMF and potential difference are two different things. So look at the difference. So PD or potential difference is the energy converted, right? Now potential difference we are converting from, so energy converted from electrical to other forms. Right? And when I say other forms, that's like in the case of the bulb, we convert them from electrical to light. So from electrical to other forms per unit coulomb of charge. Right? That is what potential difference is. Right? So it's the energy converted per unit coulomb of charge. And the formula we're using to do that is this formula here, the V called E on Q. Now, EMF now is something that is different, right? So EMF is the energy converted, notice the formula, start, um, the definition starts up the same way, energy converted, but the conversion is different, right? We're going from chemical, in the case of a battery, right? I just want to use chemical for now, but it could be any form, to electrical, Per unit coulomb of charge. Per unit. So U L O M B. Right? So there's a difference. Potential difference is the conversion or the energy converted from electrical to other forms per unit coulomb of charge flowing. And EMF is the energy converted from chemical to electrical per unit coulomb of charge flowing. Right? So sometimes they will ask you that in the exam. What is potential difference, right? So what else do they want you to know? Um, okay, so two other important formulas that you all need to know. You need to know that um, power is equal to energy converted over time, right? So this is in joules. So that's energy in joules. This is time in seconds. 
this is power and the SI unit for power is watts right you need to know that formula there are other power formulas that you need to know for electricity right so there's one called P equal IV right where um, P is power again so P is power in watts I is current in amps and V is voltage in volts right that's one formula for power there's another formula called P equal I squared R right so those are two formulas important to electricity so again P is power in watts so this is power in watts this is current in amps this is resistance in ohms right so I've spoken about resistances yet so power is equal to I squared R now the power equal I squared R right that's we usually use this formula to find power dissipated right power dissipated so you have electric current flowing in a circuit if you touch some of the components they're gonna get hot right and that power dissipated or that heat generated there we use I squared R to work that out right when you're trying to work out the power supplied to something we typically use P equal IV right so we use this to find the power supplied all right um, any other formula you need to know you know P equal IV right 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 cool So. all right so let's talk a little bit about circuit diagrams all right so we have two kinds of circuits so we have something called a series circuit all right now in a series circuit basically this is what we have we have one loop right with all our components so we have a switch we have a resistor we have a bulb right um, yeah let's say we just have that right if we notice something here this is what we call a series circuit because you have one loop right there's only one loop in this circuit here so that's a series circuit now we also have something called a parallel circuit right now parallel circuit looks something like this so we have a battery again but this time we have a resistor like this and we have a bulb here and we have this this type of circuit is what you call a parallel circuit right now why is it a parallel circuit notice what's going on here we have one loop here we also have a next loop here right so that's what we call a parallel circuit a series circuit is easy to spot it's one loop whereas a parallel circuit we're gonna have multiple loops in that circuit right now um, what do you need to know here you need to know about a cell I'm not gonna talk about a cell right now So before we could even talk about any kind of circuit we have two instruments that we need to talk about we have something called an ammeter right now you all should have had some kind of practice in your lab with this right so you have something called an ammeter and we use an ammeter to measure current right so we use an ammeter to measure current now here's the thing if we have a circuit like this right and I want to measure my current by the way this is the circuit symbol for an ammeter right and I have a resistor here 
let's say two resistors right the resistor is basically a rectangle right there's another symbol that you will need to know for resistor right which is something looking like this right so anyway so we have a, a circuit here it's a positive terminal the longer stroke is a positive terminal the shorter one is a negative terminal so current flows this way so if I want to measure the current in this series circuit right what I need to do I need to put my ammeter in series right with the component that I'm trying to measure so I want to measure the current this current here flowing through this resistor let's call it a let's call it resistor B in order to measure a current I I need to place my ammeter in series so my ammeter is connected in series so the ammeter is connected in series right now if you're connecting this ammeter in series right it means that for an ideal ammeter the resistance has to be zero right so for an ideal ammeter So for an ideal ammeter, the resistance of that ammeter has to be zero ohms, right? Now, that's an exam question. They can ask you, how do we connect an ammeter? We tell them it's connected in series. Um, they can ask you for an ideal ammeter, what should the resistance be? So And why? So the resistance of an ideal ammeter has to be zero ohms because you are putting this ammeter in series in your circuit, meaning that if it has a resistance, it's going to impact or change the current being measured, right? So you need to be able to explain that. So it's connected in series. The ideal ammeter has to have zero resistance because if it did have a resistance, what will happen is that it's going to alter the actual current being measured, right? So that is our ammeter, right? That's this. Now, we also have another um, another instrument called a voltmeter right so we use a voltmeter to measure things like potential difference so the voltmeter is to measure potential difference right so a voltmeter is used to measure potential difference now let me show you how we use that so let's say let me use the same circuit right and I want to measure the potential difference across resistor B, right? What I need to do, I need to connect my voltmeter in parallel with the device that I want to measure the potential difference of, right? So a volt, wait, I'm sorry, so a voltmeter is connected in parallel. So our voltmeter is connected in parallel. Now, the other thing they can ask you is, well, what is the resistance of an ideal voltmeter? So for an ideal voltmeter, its resistance R has to be very large or the ideal one is infinity, right? I mean, we can't get a resistance of infinity, so I'm gonna say very large. Right, and again, they can ask you why. Why do we want the voltmeter to be resistance to be very large? Now, look at something here. When you have a current, so the current I flows through resistor E, it's gonna reach this point here, this point here. But the thing is, some of the current is gonna flow through the resistor B, and some is going to want to flow through the voltmeter. Now, the thing is, if a current is flowing through the voltmeter, the potential difference that you measure in is going to change as well. So you'd want to draw as minimal current from the circuit as possible, right? So that is why the resistance of the voltmeter needs to be extremely large. So we're not altering the potential difference being measured, right? Um, I hope you all understand those concepts. So you have voltmeter, you have an ammeter. I've given you the circuit symbol for each of them, right? Now, what else was I going to show you? Okay, good. So let's talk a little, about, little bit about IV characteristics. So there's an experiment that you all need to know, right? And 
it looks like this you have a battery you have um, let's put a switch in the circuit let's put an ammeter in the circuit All right let's put a voltmeter across here and let's put a variable resistor in the circuit here now you all need to know this diagram for me please right we use this circuit to determine what we call the IV characteristic of a component right so as an electrical engineer we would typically you, if you give us a device we can determine the IV characteristics right and that will help us design certain types of circuits now make sure you know this circuit diagram please make sure you know the circuit diagram so my component or whatever I am dealing with so let me put in a little a resistor here right because this could be anything you need to be able to describe an experiment to get the IV characteristic so easiest thing to do we in the exam you might have to explain it right be very careful so set up the circuit as shown that's the first thing right diagrams help explain your answers in the exam so set up the circuit diagram as shown you um, record the current on the ammeter right now I've seen this question come for like eight marks in the exam already yeah? so record the current on the ammeter then you record the voltage on the voltmeter right then so you recorded the um well obviously i'm assuming that we turn on the switch right so i know somebody might say oh so you didn't turn on the switch yeah okay we turn on the switch um so record the voltmeter reading and record the current reading right um the next thing we're going to do now we're going to adjust the variable resistor Right, the variable resistor is this thing here, this this component here, this that's my variable resistor, right? So we adjust the variable resistor, right? And what that will do, that will change current flowing in the circuit. So what you're gonna do now is record the new reading on the ammeter. So this is what you're doing, record a new reading on your meter. Next thing we're gonna do is record the new reading on the voltmeter. Right? And then you're gonna repeat the process So you repeat any process, right, to get about six values. Six readings, let's call it readings. Right, so you repeat any process to get about six readings. Um, what is gonna happen now, you're gonna end up with a table that looks like this. So we're gonna have I, in amps, you're gonna have V in volts, and we're gonna have a, a set of readings. Basically, this is what we're gonna have, right? So this is an experiment that comes in the exam. It's an exam question, right? That's the diagram, and these are the steps, right? Now, when you get this now, we can plot some graphs, right? 
So you need to know the graphs for different things. So this is I and this is V. If we get a graph that is a straight line, that graph, right, is what we call an ohmic conductor. So it could be a resistor at constant temperature. Right? So there's a resistor at constant temperature, right? And it's a straight line passing through the origin. Now, we have our next graph here. For this particular one, you need to be able to explain this one. Right? So this is I, this is V, and this graph looks something like this. Right? And this graph is for what we call a filament lamp. Right? So those of you who still use a flashlight, right? Not an LED lamp we're talking about here. We're talking about an actual um, bulb that you see in a flashlight. Right? That's what we call a filament lamp. Now, what we notice is that the graph actually curves, right? And the reason why the graph curves is that when a filament lamp becomes heated, right? The resistance increases, right? So as the temperature increases, so as temperature increases, resistance also increases, right? And that's why the graph is that's why the graph is doing this. Starts off here and then starts to curve. Right? So this is for a filament lamp. Right? So that's one graph you need to know. There's another graph that you need to know which looks like this we have I we have V but this graph looks like this and this graph is for a semiconductor diode semiconductor diode right and the symbol for a diode is this right so what is happening here in my positive direction, right? My diode conducts in that direction. But when my voltage is negative, there's no current flowing through the diode. That's why you see in this, this flat line here, right? And a diode typically turns on, right? This is about 0 0.6 volts or 0.7 volts around there, right? So these are graphs that you need to know. Right, so if you were to do this experiment with uh, a resistor at constant temperature, you're going to get the first graph. If you use um, a filament lamp, you're going to get a second graph, and if you use a diode, you're going to get a third graph. Right, so you all need to know those graphs. Um, all right, so experiments like these now so let's talk about what resistance is so resistance right is the ratio uh, so resistance is the ratio of the potential difference ratio the potential difference to the current flow in through a conductor All right so I've just said something in words. We can write that as an equation, right? That equation is R is equal to V over I. 
where V is voltage in volts. So V is voltage in volts or potential difference in volts. I is current in amps and resistance is R. So this is resistance. And the SI unit for resistance is the ohm, right? Um, I've seen them ask any multiple choice. Um, what's an equivalent unit for the ohm? So if we have R equal V over I, um, we can say that one ohm is equal to one volt over one amp. So therefore one ohm is equal to one volt per amp, right? So one ohm is equal to one volt per amp. See what you all need to know. We would explain why. All right, so there's only one more thing I'm going to show you all before we sign off. All right. So we have resistors. We can represent a resistor by either using a rectangle, right? Can I show you this already? Or you can do this as another way to represent a resistor. So the one I've seen TXC most often use is this one, right? Um, so we have resistors and we connect resistors in series. So series, let's start with series, right? What does that mean? It means that if I have something like this, if I have three resistors connected in series and I call this R1, R2 and R3, I can find the combined resistance of those three resistors. So what I'm saying is that I can replace all of those three resistors with one big resistor, right? Which I'm going to call RT, my total resistance. Now, my total resistance RT for this is very straightforward. All you do is add them up. So it's R1 plus R2 plus R3. Right? So finding the resistance in series, extremely straightforward. Now, what about parallel? So if you have resistors connected in parallel, so let's say you have this. And so you call this R1, call this R2, call this R3. Right? These resistors are connected in parallel. Now, what we're saying is that we can replace all those three resistors with one resistor. Right? And I'm going to call that one resistor RT. In order to find this now, there's a formula for parallel resistors. It's 1 over RT is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. Right, so those are two different formulas that you need to know for series calculating the resistance in series, and this next one is for resistors in parallel. Right, now let me work two examples for you here quickly. So let's say we have um, something like this. So we have two ohms. 4 ohms and 5 ohms, right? And you want to find the total resistance. So like I said before, I can replace all of that with one resistance here, which I call RT, right? And we know that RT combined resistance is simply equal to, um, let's put on a formula. Let's call it R1 plus R2 plus R3, because you have three resistors, and this is two, plus 4, plus 5, which is 11 ohms, right? Extremely straightforward. When we have resistors in series, very easy to work out. Now, let's work out a different one now. Let's say we have something like this. We have two ohms in parallel with uh, five ohms in parallel with, um, let's say, one ohm, right?
and you want to find the equivalent resistance. So I want to replace all of the resi those resistance with just one resistor called RT. Now with this formula, you need to be careful. So because I have three resistors, let's write that formula first. So one over RT equal one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3, right? Um, so one over RT is equal to one over two plus one over five plus one over one, right? So one over RT, so what you will do, you add up everything on the right hand side. Now your calculator can work out fractions, right? Most calculators can do that. So I have plus one fifth plus one, and that gives me 17 over 10, right? So that's 17 over 10. But here's the thing, you haven't worked out RT as yet, you know. RT will be 10 over 17, right? So you need to watch out for that. Huh? So RT is equal to 10 divided by 17, and you're going to get 0 0.588 ohms. 0 0.588 ohms. All right? So this is how we calculate the... Um, Combine resistance for resistors in series. Okay. So I've gone through several things here. I will stop at this point in time because I think I'm sleepy now. Um, all right. So till I post something again. Take care.